are going to demo what we've been working on for the last quarter uh, with the Herbal Labs team. Um, it's a product called Sky, and it is the first of hopefully one day many uh, namespace renderers. This is Will. I'm Trent. Megrev Delseg. Hanfeld Avned. All right, what is Sky? Um, it's a namespace renderer. Uh, Right now, it's implemented as a progressive web app, and everything is server rendered. And what we'll show you in a second is like, you can install it on your device. It'll open up as a native-looking app uh, and give you access to your namespace. Um, like I said, one of many possible uh, namespace renderers, one of the ones we want to build out uh, in the near future is like a command line terminal. So kind of like the Linux command line where you can like CD into some path in your namespace and then view things in like a more developer focused way. Uh, we had that, but then in the Neo rewrite, it got taken away. So one day again. Um, and Sky itself is actually a shrub. So it lives in your namespace. And the way that rendering works is that the top level shrub binds to an air endpoint. And then when a request comes in, it pokes that top level shrub top level shrub creates a child, which is a handler. The handler has some dependency out to wherever in the namespace it's trying to render. It renders it, and then as soon as it passes the request back, uh, the handler like tombstones itself, basically. So all of the requests are in the namespace. All right, so like Gary said, our target audience initially is you guys. Uh, we want to get people building uh, apps in the namespace and rendering them in the namespace. And then once there's a solid base there, we're going to focus on power tools, people who are really interested in the idea of owning their own data, writing programs against their own data, Emacs people, stuff like that. And then once all that's solid, broaden out to social media applications, normal people. And surprise, this presentation is actually being given from inside of Sky. So I can hit Escape. And I can show you guys this is a presentation app that we made. Uh, on the left, we have an Udon document, uh, which separates slides with the horizontal rule. And then on the right, we have a preview of it. So let's go ahead and edit. Uh, no spoilers. Um, OK, let's edit this here. And we can say, uh, always have been. So yeah, we're in the namespace here. All right, so I'm going to show you guys how to navigate around Sky. It's similar in a lot of ways to a web browser. Uh, on the left here, sit down so you guys can see, we have kind of like tabs. Like you so would have, make it bigger? probably. Uh, is that big enough? We'll just, there you go. Uh, so these are your tabs, and you can have multiple tabs open at the same time. So you can open up your home shrub. And this gives you kind of like a landscape-like experience where you can, I don't know, boot into some of these other experiences that we've made. Uh, the top bar here shows you the path in your namespace that you're currently viewing. And we have some toggles for like moving the windows around, et cetera. Um, we'll close this for now. And then let's actually go into present mode here. And then boom, boom, boom. All right. So you can have up to four windows open at a time. If you have like three, it will do like a binary space partition algorithm. And then four, this, this third one here gets uh, split in half. And for the most part, like on, on mobile, it will only ever show the zeroth slot. Uh, and that's how it works on like when you have it installed on your phone. You can kind of like view your tabs and then switch back and forth, whichever one's in the first position. Um, here. All right, so right now we have this super basic like gray and white theme. Uh, but this is your computer. Probably you want to do something a little bit fancier than that. So let's, uh, let's rice our, our distro here. So we can 
copy this image. Let's uh, get rid of these guys. And then open up our settings. And in your settings, you can control pretty much all of the visual aspects of Sky. So we can add this background image here. We can add some image compositing. Uh, you can have some i3 style gaps. So you can, I don't know, make it look really fancy. You can change the typeface that you're using. So let's find a wacky one. Uh, Futura, that looks actually kind of terrible. What about, what about Palantino? Eh. No Comic Sans. No, we don't have Comic Sans yet? Try it one day. <laughs> um, let's just go back to Verdana. Classic. Um, all right, yeah, you can change font size. Uh, letter spacing, kerning as they say, <laughs> line height. And then we have uh, all of the styling uh, in Sky is based on CSS variables. And then from those CSS variables, we build up a set of CSS classes, uh, which developers can use like Tailwind. And as long as they stick within those classes, the user has full control over what their apps look like. As a developer, that's you know, completely optional. If you want to like break out of that and build a very customized experience inside of here, you have control to do that. But we're trying to make it as easy as possible to um, let developers treat this as the user's computer and not as like a product that we're putting onto the user. Um, and I feel like developers want to do that, but it just hasn't always been easy to do that in the past. So. You can like, I don't know, make your background red if you want to. Uh, and then, yeah, these are the, the base colors. You have eight foreground and eight background colors. Save that there. And then, yeah, let's keep it moving. Um, we've built six or seven apps so far. Um, all of these render within Sky. And uh, I guess we'll demo them uh, now. Yeah, let's start with Diary. So yeah, aside from the counter that Liam showed off, Diary is like the simplest shrub you could imagine, where all it is just you have a text box, uh, you put some text in the text box, you poke it, and then it produces a child underneath it. And then the renderer displays all of the children that it has underneath it, and that is the entirety of the shrub. Boom. Right, let me get back to presentation. Yep, that's Diary. What's next? Files. Do, 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 do. Yep. Uh, okay, so files. This is like a file manager. Um, you have a few different types of files that you can create. One of them is a folder, so you can nest them. Uh, right here, I have a notes folder where I keep some notes, like grocery list and my thoughts about birds. Um, one of the file types that you can create, which we'll talk about in a second, is like just a sale document, um, which because sale and udon are kind of, uh, I don't know, metacircular or whatever, it's good for writing documents, but you can also like do a, a, any arbitrary CSS JavaScript stuff inside of here. So this is just a JavaScript game uh, that you can put inside of your, your files, I guess. I don't know. It's Frogger, it's fun. Uh, you can just paste stuff in there. This slide, sky presentation is inside of a file. Um, yeah, you can basically make any of the apps that we've made over here. You can put them in your namespace, uh, make them willy-nilly. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the other ones. You want to talk about tasks? Yeah, yeah, tasks. So tasks is kind of illustrating the uh, recursive nature of how you can set up your shrub. So a task, like we are looking at a task right now, and a task implementation, <laughs> I'm just re now reading it. Um, <laughs> in, in the kids arm of the task implementation, it defines its kids as being tasks. And so if you click on this arrow to the right, uh, you can see the view of that task along with its subtasks. And so we have it set up to where you cannot accomplish a task until all of its subtasks are accomplished. And so, you know, nope, they were his, yeah. Right, and so we could, uh, if we pop back up to three here, 
Yeah, like try to try to accomplish that. But we can't because there's a subtask that is not completed. So if you go inside there and then accomplish the subtask, uh, and then we pop back up, we'll see that this is now auto-completed because we completed all of the subtasks. But also now you have freedom to either say it's completed or not completed, and then you know that, yeah. that doesn't affect that. And so you get this really interesting like recursive implementation and rendering where you, as long as you're rendering yourself and your kids, then you can just, you know infinitely nest your tasks um, with your top level tasks interface itself just being a task. Cool. Uh, so now let's look at the sale editor. Um, go back to file. Actually, let's, I'll pull up the documentation for the uh, CSS library. This is inside of here. So this is like a prose document. Um, you know, you, it's written mostly in like a markdown style with Udon, but there's some of the stuff in here where, okay, we needed a little bit more structure to demonstrate some of the CSS stuff. So you have the ability to break out into like Hoon inside of here and really con like in a compact, neat way, build UIs that kind of mix and match with your pros. So this is a little explainer for all the classes that we have available. and. It live updates, so if we scroll back up to the top, you know, we can just say, you know, hello people. And then after it re-renders on the back end, uh, you have a really tight loop for prototyping UIs. And for most of the apps that we've built in here, um, this is kind of how we start out by building the UI. Instead of like starting from the back end, we can just have this really fast iteration loop on a local ship where you sketch out the UI, and then you sketch out your types. And because this is all, you know, you, you, you can embed like an entire core in here. Like uh, you can do a, a mclus and then a core like that. And then uh, div hello. And then you have some arm called hi. And this is another div. Uh, maybe this one says hello. And then here we just reference hi. Well, hold on. Uh, wait, no, it worked. Hey, uh, syntax error. There we go. All right. So what you can do in here is you can now like define some types. And you can start to uh, iteratively bring the back end into your front end as you're developing and start to think about, OK, now that I know what this, the shape of the front end is going to look like, I can start thinking about the types. And then you sub in some dummy data. And then pretty quickly, you have the shape of an app all within like a very cohesive Iterative loop. An extension. Yes, an extension. No apps. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Watch my words. Here. All right. OK. Um, let's go back to the slides. All right. Uh, planner. This is a fun one. Uh, I'll talk about planner. Um, so I was trying to dog food. Um, like <laughs> using this as like a integrated development environment, and I wanted to see if I could make a shrub completely from my phone. So I, I was on the plane over to Barcelona like two weeks ago, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna write a calendar app style thing completely on my phone just by typing Hoon into text boxes. And I was able to make this in like six hours uh, with a front end and a back end completely from my iPhone, just typing Hoon into text boxes. Uh, so you have you know, some window that you evaluate. You can like, <laughs> OK. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you see from a date range to a date range, and you can create events and multi-day events and everything. Um, yeah, so on the 27th, I have a date with your mom. Congrats. I'm your dad. Um, and yeah, it's. Uh, a lot of this stuff has a lot of work to do to like clean up the UIs and like make this production ready, but it's cool that like the system is now coherent enough that you can like just sit down and build an app and then it works and then you have it on your phone and it syncs to your laptop in the cloud. Like it is kind of what I wanted when I first got into Urbit was like basically Emacs, but I can have it on my phone. It's like an integrated environment where I can write programs against my own data and like if I need to modify the UI. We'll show that in a second, like modifying the UI from within the system, stuff like that. Yeah. 
Uh, Messenger, okay, so this is probably the most complex architecture for one of our experiences that we have outside of Excel. And so uh, if you'll remember, Liam showed off a chat app and it used the message protocol, which is just uh, author, text, and a timestamp. Uh, this is not that chat app though. This is a um, completely different chat app that is written using that same protocol. And, and you know, I didn't do this to be cute and like illustrate, oh look, you can use protocols for multiple things. This was just the like natural, objectively best way to build it. And so we have this, you know, at bottom there's this uh, message protocol, which is just a data type that implementations can pull in. Um, and then on top of that we have these two primitives. So there's a message pub which just, it works exactly like diary. It takes in a message as a poke, and then it spawns a child underneath it. Uh, and then we have message sub, which just, uh, when you create it, you provide it the path to a message pub as a dependency. And then it just mirrors all of the children that the message pub creates. And what we can then build on top of that, so, so uh, you know, from this UI, it kind of looks like one thing. There are actually two things going on under the surface here. We have DMs and we have group chats. And so DMs is a symmetrical implementation of message pub and message sub where you create a DM and then you publish your own messages and you subscribe to the other party's messages and they publish their own messages and they subscribe to your messages. Uh, with group chats, there's only one publisher and there are many subscribers. So you have, you know, everyone pokes the host and then those, uh, messages get sent to the one message pub and then the many message subs pull the data from the message pub. Uh, and then on the top level, uh, so, so the DM thing is tricky because as Ted said yesterday, we don't have service discovery yet. And so if I wanna start a DM with you, like I don't know where in your namespace necessarily you want to uh, store your DMs. And also like, your DM shrub doesn't even exist yet. So we actually need to have this higher level thing that you can poke in a, you know, you wanna be able to predict where it is. And so this top level app that we call Messenger is just a thin wrapper over the group chat and DM functionality where uh, when you tell Messenger, okay, I wanna start a DM with Migrev, it will say, okay, I, because I am Messenger and I am this top level app experience thing, am going to, in my opinionated way, Assume that MigRev's messenger implementation also lives at MigRev, FAS Home, FAS Messenger. I'm going to poke that messenger and then we are going to negotiate the DM connection from there. Yep. And uh, I think the messenger app is currently broken on the live network version, um, but we'll get that fixed. Um, and then, yeah, we have a slideshow app, uh, which we kind of already demoed, so we'll skip past that. And then Excel, uh, this was Trent's idea basically. It was a 2D command line interface. So I'll let you kind of like talk through it and I'll just kind of click around and uh, make some, some edits yeah, in yeah, here. There might be a lot going on here at the bottom. So, so I'll try to kind of narrate as you go and then also give some background. So you know, I think it was a couple months ago we were generating ideas for things that we wanted to build in Shrubbery. And we had a list of like 30 ideas. I think it was Motville who suggested that we build Excel. And I think that like, it, it might've been you, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and like, you know, I think that Anthony and then like the membrane team from back in the day had just incepted that into my brain as being a good idea. And so, yeah, I ran with that concept because we have dependencies which are kind of like references. And so uh, the original concept behind Excel was, okay, you're gonna have a bunch of cells and then Excel itself is just kind of a parent container that forwards pokes down into them. And the state of a cell is, um, a formula and then the output of that formula and then potentially the cell is given some dependencies when it's created and then the formula gets run on those dependencies. Now the downside of doing it that way is that in a shrub's type definition, you need to provide it with a set of dependencies. And so you can't have an arbitrary number of arbitrarily typed dependencies unless, you know, my, my inelegant solution to this was to say, okay, we have 26 dependencies A through Z and they have any arbitrary type. But what this really points to is that we want code gen. Like Excel, um, you know, Liam said this a few weeks ago, Excel is really more like a build system than anything. And so uh, Liam did a pass on Excel and the way he changed it was rather than poking Excel and having that just directly make a cell of this predefined imp type that you've already specified, uh, it's going to poke Excel and then it creates this thing called an Excel conf. And this has an arm inside of it that returns a shrub and you just, uh, you know, you pass the arguments that you type in here into the core that generates the shrub. 
uh, that shrub gets generated, passed to forward, and built and run, and then the output gets sent to, um, well, so, so this input gets turned into a child of the Excel cell, and then the output gets turned into another child of the Excel cell, such that when you click this copy button, uh, it will copy specifically the output value, rather than the entirety of your dependencies and inputs and everything. Yep. So... Right, so, so here's the face that the code will refer to. Uh, right. We'll call it ref, and then if he types in ref, um, he's pulling okay. from cell one, two. And then when you change the original data, it will change that data. And you can pull this data from anywhere in your namespace. And so I don't know if you have like a, a copied path on hand from like diary or if we want to go get yeah, that. Yeah, so this that. Uh, cell down here, its reference is pointing to a diary entry. And then I can pull up that diary entry. Uh, ba -ba, diary. That is hello world. Scroll over here. Uh, we'll say goodbye worlds. <laughs> and then, uh, inshallah. Oh, all right. Well, it updated on here. UI bug didn't update up there. Not bad. Bummer. Oh, there it goes. Hey, we got it. Okay. <laughs> um, and then we should show we should show the pokes too. Um, yeah. So yeah, one thing we should show here. I wrote a core here. Like you write arbitrary hoon as your formula. So I, I wrote a core, and then I referenced the core and this number here. And then in the code, you can like build up kind of interesting little development environments. It is kind of a build system. And then you can also use the output of these. Uh, as the input to a poke to somewhere else. Um, so, you know, that could be something we could demo if I remember off the top of my head. Um, put entry hello. Right, so, so this is like the poke that a diary is expecting to take. Yeah, this is a diary diff. So I can send this as a diary diff to Wes home diary, I add that, and then I can send it, and then we will see Let's if see. it works. We believe in live demos here. So. Yes. OK, diary. Nope. Oh. Well, maybe we'll refresh. Oh, refreshing broke. All right, well, it didn't work. Well, so as you can see, work in progress, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can do some powerful stuff with this, and, and like you could imagine you know, when all of your data is inside of this namespace, all the things you could do with it. Is it, do you always even explicitly press send, or can you make it send whenever it changes? In this implementation, you do want it to only trigger when you press send, because otherwise you don't want to like type a character and then have it send the poke every time you type a character. But I, th I think that's how we were originally doing it, and we, and we had some weirdness there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting problem, right? Because like, you don't really want your spreadsheet just like, Sending out a ton of effects is kind of like a big risk of like, getting effects out of spreadsheets in general. Mm -hmm. um, so Liam was talking about having a sort of like max MSP style, like filtering and debouncing, all that stuff. So basically, <laughs> you could put various filters on the like something that's reading from the spreadsheet so that it would only periodically send out an effect or only what certain criteria are met, like certain thresholds. Maybe have like guards on it so it won't send the same thing more than once. That, yeah, and so probably the next step in order to get there is to have like stateful cells where you know maybe you have a bane timer, and then when the bane timer goes off, the the cell triggers the poke, and um, yeah, this whole signal processing idea that Liam's been talking about. All right, so what we'll show now is this dependency is actually referencing something on somebody else's ship. So this is the other fake ship I have running, same diary entry, goodbye world. We can come back here and change it back to. Hello world. And then within six to eight seconds, it'll change back to hello world. So the, the point in showing that is that in shrubbery, the way you reference data on your own ship is the same way you reference data on somebody else's ship. And that's the point of the whole system. Is like there's only the distinction between in your kids and then outside your kids. Doesn't matter where it is. Mopple. Yeah. Yeah, so 
like you get a uh, a poke uh, to your shrub when one of your dependencies changes and on the creation of that dependency. So if you want to copy in that data, the first time you hear that specific kind of poke, it's called a rely poke, you can take the data of that and then mirror it into your own namespace underneath your children. And you can even keep it up to date. Every time it changes, you can mirror it into your own namespace. So that's like a persistent copy or like a like a synchronization that's constant, but you always have access to it. Or you could just do a one-time copy and then remove the dependency and then you just have it that one time. Okay, so if you had a movement, you could download it, put it online. Yeah. And you delete it, I it. Yep, yeah. And that's the general pattern that like we're encouraging at this point is uh, dependencies are good for synchronizing stuff, but if you want to like modify that or transform it in any way, you want to have it in your own namespace. And in fact, on the rendering layer, we force you to not use uh, data from the de dependencies at all. If you're rendering it, it has to be in your own namespace, or in your kids, basically. Uh, yeah. in, in that question, how do you decentralize data in structure? Can we talk about that? Decentralized data? Yeah. Like, so we share group chat. How does that, how does that work? Oh, um, the whole like, uh, idea of like not necessarily like requiring like like how you can like a small set consensus sort of thing yeah. like yeah, yeah how you can to it. yeah so this is like relatively trivial and it's like um it's I said it again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah basically you can just like have a group chat where like you know you can do it like basically the same way that the DMs works. So it's like that's a trivial one one example of this, but you can basically do if you have some state machine that takes devs and produces new state then you can have a series of dependencies and, like, and you're like sourcing the diffs from like a whole variety of chips and everybody just like publishes into their own diffs and it'll get synchronized. So you can, you can do that same DMs model for like multi body. It's just like shrub is a little slower right now. Um, and so it's like not the greatest scale I also just wanted to get to the networking where I just it All right. Uh, so because all of the nodes, all of the shrubs share a similar structure, uh, what we can do is we can provide like debug interfaces uh, natively for all of the apps. So this menu here will open up kind of like a raw view of everything that's underneath this tree. So I have two entries in my diary. This is the relative path underneath me. And then if I click on one of them, I can open up the raw view of that. This diary entry does not have any children, but it does have a state. And this is like the uh, you know, pretty printed uh, text of this state. If I can, I, I won't show a more complicated example, but it, it basically runs it through the pretty printer, whatever's at that, that point in the tree. Uh, and then this is looking at the dot chords, uh, or the, the, this is like the, the stud, the, the type of the data that's at this node. And then I can click on that and it will bring me to the source code for that protocol. And then this is like a Hoon editor where now we're getting into like, you can edit the type that is there and then it will live evaluate and, and refresh everything. Um, so quick little demo of the keyboard navigation. Um, we want this to feel like kind of a developer tool. So you can press the space bar and it will create an overlay of all of the buttons in like a, you know, was it Vimfox or whatever style? Um, and then you can narrow down and like I can open up this little menu up on the right by doing that. Um, yeah. And it will will work with every, thank you. Yeah. As long as developers aren't doing something like insane, like making divs clickable or something, it'll work with all of the apps that people try to build inside of here. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, okay, moving on. Okay. Uh, how do they get assigned? So there's like a set of keys that it will like randomly uh, spit out to all of the clickable regions and it will look on that specific button. Like the developer can put a hint on it basically and say, hey, for the overlay, I want this one to always be the letter M. Um, but if there's no hint there, it'll just choose an available letter. 
and then if there's more buttons on the screen than there are available letters, you just have to click multiple buttons to narrow down to the, the one you're selecting. This is in the weeds, but can you modify the list of available letters? Uh, not yet, okay. but yeah, it, it should be available, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some Dvorak keyboard users I see or something, yeah. Oh, it's you. <laughs> Okay, so let's try to do a demo of editing some, some code here. So Gary, during one of our workshops, made an app called Circle, which is like a local set of ships. Uh, it's a very simple app. It just stores basically a list of pat peas, and then other shrubs can point to this as a dependency for you know, a friends list or an access control list. It's incredibly generic. We can you know, type in you know, migrev dalseg here, it adds it. Uh, so let's pull up the UI for this. This is called circle HTMX. And let's change this uh, circle icon up here to be a square. We can save that, refresh the UI. Now it's a square. We can uh, use some of the CSS classes to add like a background color. So that's the background for red. Now we have a, a red squared circle. Uh, and you can do this with the UIs. You can do this with the implementations. So you could change the logic of your app. And then, yeah, this is how you get to something like coding on your phone from anywhere, uh, that kind of thing. Is it like an undo tree? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, there is, uh, recently I, I did put in uh, like actual error handling. So if I have some error and this doesn't compile, it will give me a nice little syntax error with the line. And then I can it, it fix it, resave it, and then it goes away. Uh, these. Uh, little buttons up here are reading from the dot chords from the compiled file of this, and these will take you to the source code for uh, the protocols that are being used here. So this is circle diff. If I go to that, it'll take me to uh, protocol circle diff, and yeah, pull up source code. And then what else? Losing my spot here. Okay. Do you want to talk about this? Or I can talk. Yeah, yeah, you take this one. Okay, so at a high level, the way that UIs are rendered uh, in Sky is using the shrubbery conversion system. So there's a very clean decoupling of your back end logic and your front end logic. You could have multiple clients that render in completely different ways. Sky's opinion is that everything will be completely server rendered. Um, you can do some like JavaScript like optimistic rendering if you want, but uh, for every subtree, it will find conversions of the nodes in that subtree, kind of build them together in a, into an interface on the back end using sale, and then it will send them back. And then for like post requests or commands, a request comes in, it parses that into a command, pokes wherever you're trying to poke, and then it will build the UI for the thing you just poked and send it back to you. Um, and then the two ways that the UI can update its, or the client can update its UI after that is uh, with HTMX style swaps. So we'll just send you the new UI. You can take a subtree of the DOM that we just sent you and swap it in over top of your UI. Or you can just ignore what we've sent you back from the client or from the server and then do some JavaScript to manipulate the DOM on your own if you want. Uh, and also, if you don't want to do server rendering, uh, you can just write conversions to JSON and then hit the endpoints. It'll send you back JSON, and then your client can render however it wants to. So uh, lots of possible rendering stuff. In that use case, like, um, is there a model uh, in this world that's like, similar to sort of like the uh, blog posted like, SPS, where you do like, a separately hosted thing if you're like, sending back JSON from the stuff? Uh, I mean, you, we don't have anything that's close to Glob right now, but you could just like store your 
SPA as a PAT-T and then send that from an endpoint uh, if you wanted to, yeah. Is there any like specific sky logic or assume someone wrote another render that expects to render sale, would um, UIs built for sky basically just work? Yeah, it, it, it just returns a manx. Um, and then you can kind of like stitch together certain transformations on that manx. So the, the way, it doesn't currently work this way, but the way it's going to work is like all of the requests come in through the same conversion entry point, and then they all come out through the same conversion exit point. And then along the way, the developer kind of gets to choose the branches that it goes on to parse the request, and then the branches it goes on to create the response for it uh, by building up their own conversions from like smaller and smaller types as it goes down the tree and then bigger and bigger types as it melds the response back together into a UI. Yeah. Is Sky able to expose anything to your web? Um, <laughs> uh, you, you wouldn't believe it, but actually everything is exposed to ClearWeb right now. We uh, don't have any authentication. <laughs> uh, but um, through Sky directly, you know, not right now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering, like, if it's for like a wiki case, right? If I build an app where I want there to be a Sky UI, but then also a way to like show the same content as just like a normal web two So like like CMS. Yeah. Like, kind of it, I, I publish like most of things. I think you probably at that point just want a different render that's not trying to like put these things into windows that you can move around. Like it just takes the thing that's inside of that window and then exposes it as like a full page app. And these renderers, like Sky itself, the logic of it is like 300 lines. It's, it's not that, that much. And, and building more of these uh, renderers I think is going to be a common thing that people are able to do. You just you know, hook into the near endpoint and then you can serve stuff to the clear web however you want, yeah. The renderer is just another shrub, yeah. Everything, it, it didn't used to be, but like, I don't know, probably a month ago now, yeah, we moved all of the logic out from, from Neo's logic and everything is just a shrub now, yeah. Okay. Although presumably, if you're gonna put it on the clear web, presumably you just have your shrub write some HTML you know, somewhere else, because it's on the clear web, and they're gonna be reading the HTML, you know, just put that in there. Yeah, it's being converted from its own state to the type of HTML through the conversion file that you um, specify for that. And like because of the referential transparency stuff, like the caching on this can be made really, really nice. So like load time should be incredible. Um, all right, so where to get started? If you're interested in building a UI for this, I think afterwards we'll have like a little demo session if you guys are interested. Um, yeah, but go to github.com slash urbit slash shrub, pull down the dev summit branch, and then uh, yeah, we can make some shrubs. Uh, shrubs.